Hello, you are listening to the Gamer Librarian Podcast, the best podcast you can find on this side of the multiverse. I am your host, Adrian, and today I will be talking about the newly released Marvel Multiverses RPG, the sequels in the Ring novel series Spiral and Loop by Koji Suzuki, and more. Afterwards, be sure to subscribe to be notified when future episodes are released, and show your support by liking and leaving a comment. Thank you for joining. Well, guys, it's already August. It's crazy to think that this year is more than halfway over. I hope you guys have been having a really good summer. I've been trying to enjoy the weather as much as I can when uh, it's nice out. And for this episode, I just think it's going to be really nice and chill. Uh, We have something that's really interesting today. Something that I'm a super big fan of, and that's tabletop RPGs and Marvel Comics. And they just mesh so well together. Now, before we get into the main core book for the Marvel Multiverse RPG, you guys should know that I am no uh, stranger when it comes to RPGs or comic book RPGs. Um, Sometime last year, I did a game for my friends with um, Mutants and Masterminds with a Marvel skin over it. Uh, The players made a team called the Just Us League, and we played that for about a year or a little more, and that was really fun. And I chose Mutants Masterminds because the playtest book that the Marvel Multiverse book first put out was, didn't really have all that I really wanted. It didn't have, like, speed powers or, or things like that. Um, it was a playtest book, so you can't fault it for that, but I, I did want something more. So the stipend waiting for this book, we started Mutants and Masterminds, and that was really fun. And Mutants and Masterminds had a really good system uh, for itself where... Its main focus was the powers. You can mix and match powers all you wanted in that game, and I felt like that was really great on a player level just to be, like, experimenting or um, getting a sense of what kind of character that you want to play as, and that was really nice. So when that game ended, I was, like, in a lull because I really wanted to have the Marvel Multiverse game in my hand, and now that it's here, I'm so excited. I'm so happy to have this out because I've been wanting it since they announced it, I think in 2020, right? It was like right when the pandemic started, and I was like, oh, this is never coming out. This is never going to be a thing. I'm never going to get it. And now it's here. And um, I got to say, it has a lot that I would have expected for this type of book, especially in the sense that it has some things for, for lore, ways to integrate your game into the already established Marvel canon, which isn't a super big deal, because when I think about it, you can pick and choose whatever you would like from Marvel Comics or create your own kind of stuff when when it comes to these kind of games. You don't really need to be super constricted to its rules or lore. It's more for fun and imaginary, you know, kind of sense. But this came out, I think, earlier this week, maybe last week, and you can buy it on Amazon for physical books, and if you go to um, Demiplane, I think you'll probably get a PDF version. I would probably going to go do that eventually. I never got the PDF version. I pre-ordered it off Amazon just to get the physical book. Um, so you, maybe the, I'll put links in the description for you guys just to go and do that. I'm going to try and remember to do that. And let's get into the book because there's a lot here that I think is really important. And I'm, I'm going to try and maybe put up some pictures of certain parts in the book. Um, I'm going to do my best to do that just to give you guys an idea of what really is inside of it, how the layout looks. But from someone who's pretty versed in RPGs, this seems really extensive. I haven't tested it yet. I haven't done anything with the proper mechanics. But just looking at it, it seems like it's really concise and it's really forward with its presentation to you. The information seems really easy to grasp. And honestly, let's just get into it. So there is like a how to play section where it'll give you like the basic rundown of using the tabletop book and uh, being on a table setting and house rules and uh, making the kind of game that you want, which is nice. I, I, I like that books include this. They're pretty generic across all RPG core books. They always use they have the same kind of concept. Like here's the rules, how dice works, how character sheet works. Usually you just have pemper, uh, pencil, pa- paper, and dice. And those kind of things. Um, for chapter two, you get into the more like core mechanics. This game uses a uh, three 
d6 system. You roll three uh, d6 dice, and they call it the 616 system, you know, for, for the Marvel um, 616 universe. And they, they do that, so when you roll your die, if you get a uh, number one, that counts as like a very special, like critical success, like fantastic result. Um, if you roll a one on your Marvel die, or whatever you designate to be like the Marvel die, um, for like posterity's sake, uh, we'll call like the Marvel die, like a, it's like a red die versus like a regular white dies. Uh, for the audio format, it's a little difficult to try and like portray how these uh, mechanics might be. Uh, I apologize for that, but, um, so this game works like any other kind of RPG when you have, like, a, a set number that you want to beat, like a target number, they call it in this game, or a DC, maybe if you're more familiar with, um, uh, D&D, so when you, uh, meet or go over the target number, then that counts as a success in the game, or if you go under, it'll be a failure, uh, that's pretty standard for these kind of games. And they have all the rules for, like, uh, modifiers, adding to rolls. They have things called edges and troubles, which give, like, bonuses to your rolls. And those stack, which seems pretty great. Or at least, like, stacking edges uh, seems pretty nice. Um, there is a section on how to do the math. Um, RPG games are pretty math-heavy. So, obviously, having a calculator and, like, scratch paper for just quickly jotting down notes and numbers is really helpful. Um, but... Not too much on the rules, just because I haven't really gone over that, and kind of explaining that all to you isn't really going to be beneficial, at least in this. Uh, I would like this to be more as like an informative kind of thing, just for RPGs and themselves, um, because I think they're for everybody. I truly think that like these RPG tabletop books are the pinnacle of video games that you could ever get. You don't need graphics, you don't need like um, really good uh, like controller combat or um, vast narrative world. You don't super need that when it comes to these tabletop games. You can just have a character and experience uh, small scenarios as you play with a group of friends, and I found that really great. It's like the ultimate multiplayer experience outside of a video game. And the only issue with like tabletop games like these is finding the time to play with people, you know, because you have to schedule blocks of time for a few hours per, per week or maybe once a day, like per month. So those are kind of the things you got to worry about when it comes to these tabletop RPGs. And let's just move on to chapter three, where we get into the character profiles. This is where you're going to be making your character. You're going to be giving your character things like their code names and their secret identities their um their height and weight gender hair um where they're from how they look where their base is um their origins if they have a job a, a brief history on them if they have that and their personality what kind of character are you going to be portraying here what is their personality and then you get into things like their rank which is their level you have up to um six ranks rookie protector champion legend mythic and cosmic I think if people understand, like, generic superhero kind of tier list, you probably get a good understanding. You know, like, a rookie is probably your first ever superhero or, like, no powers at all kind of person. Protector and champion is probably, like, your mid-level superheroes. Uh, in the book, it says, like, Kamala Khan, for, for example, for champion. And then you get, to, like, Legends, which is, like, your uh, Black Panther, Captain America's, your mythic characters, is your, like, your Scarlet Witches and Thor's. And then Cosmic is obviously your Captain Marvels and Silver Surfers. So something about this game specifically, and that I, I did find somewhat troubling when I was playing Mutants and Masterminds, and I imagine this is going to be a thing in this game, but um, I'm not a, a number cruncher, so I'm not going to be super critical on how things are balanced in this game. But it does seem like when it comes to superheroes, balancing out um, the Cosmic villains versus like your rookie characters or your your no power people is is pretty challenging you know because if, if you play a, a a hero who's maybe something more like lines of um daredevil or black widow people who don't necessarily have um super super powers you know they're not alternating realities or or doing anything like that but they can hold their own but they're gonna have a hard time fighting against people like like thor or silver surfer or galactus you know and in this game you can play as those you know uh Besides what the DM says, or what this game calls them, the narrator, um, you can pick 
whatever rank you want for your character. If you want to play a cosmic character, you totally could. Or you could just be like a beat cop rookie or a daredevil kind of uh, protector um, individual. So that is like something that I think is really conscious about these superhero games is how do you balance those strict power levels? And obviously you're going to get into things like team dynamics and then versing your villains and things like that. It's very, very strenuous. Um, so as a DM and as players, that's something that you need to be conscious of when you make characters or make a game for this. Um, the core scores in this game, like the ability scores that you have, is pretty standard. You have melee, agility, resilience, vigilance, ego, logic. Uh, anybody who's familiar with any kind of RPG uh uh, like ideas, you're going to have a pretty good understanding of what these mean. Those are pretty substandard if you've already played like things like D&D. Um, you get like a, a health in this game. You get something like, that's like focus, which is like willpower. Um, karma seems to be like your luck in this game. I like when games include this. I like when games include um, uh, mechanics that players can use to turn the tide and be, be beneficial in some way that's not a dice roll or like a, a, an ability it's like a resource that you can use that could maybe change the game combatively or even narratively in some way I, I love things like that i like when games add um other ways for players to interact with the game that's really not um just making roles mutants and masterminds had a really good system with that called um uh what was it um story points i i think it was where if you use one you could either affect a role or a narrative or the the dm would like give a piece of information it's it's things like that it's nice to have uh, mechanics like that because it feels like the players will have a lot more um options when it comes to playing the game outside of um role playing a character and stuff like that um, and then you get into things like your initiative, your speed, how much damage you do, your size absolutely matters for anybody who understands Marvel Universe. Uh, there's characters such as Ant-Man who can change their size on will. Um, then there's power sets and um, powers, which is a little more um, specific in this game because there's specific powers like flight and super strength and te tele uh, telepathy, but we'll get to that in a, a few more chapters later. And up next is backstories. This is where you're going to make, like, your origin for the characters. Um, for here, they give things like um, you're an alien or you got your powers from having some kind of high-tech uh, device or magic or you're a mutant. Maybe you got special training or you were part of some weird science program. Those are your origins for your superpowers or your superhero character. And, and obviously, this isn't strictly just superheroes. Uh, you can make supervillains... And there are super villains in the Marvel Universe that are in the book that you could just quickly take stats from and just make your own. So you can have your hero, your villain, or your anti-hero, anti-villain kind of campaign if you want to do that. Obviously, some superheroes, they live on Earth. They have regular jobs. So you could pick things like a criminal or healthcare worker, journalists, lawyers, leaders, spies, scientists, all kinds of things. And then you get stuff like traits and tycoon or traits and tags, with uh, adding like things like uh, heroic or being poor or secret identity to your character, which I think is really great. And not for nothing, but the character sheets does look daunting. I think I will put a picture of what Spider-Man's character sheet looks like in here because it is very heavy-handed. Uh, just 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 from the um, book itself. They list Spider-Man Peter Parker, specifically, as a rank 4 uh, hero. That's about a, if we go back, a rank 4 hero is a legend hero, same as your Black Panther and Captain America. And looking at his sheet, it is full. He has a full set of powers. He has high-end stats, things that are like around 15 or higher, which is seems pretty above average for um, certain... Uh, characters in this game um and it's just a whole slew of stuff which really looks neat absolutely looks great and after that we get into the combat for the game now things like playing on um grids like using tabletop grids or even if you're using a virtual grid on a on like a server or a desktop um or even theater of the mind stuff these are all things that will affect gameplay and that's coming from personal experience 
because I can see how um, grids and tabletop uh, tables and theater of the mind, all of that can be beneficial to your game. Um, but it's really important that when you have combat that if something is important to combat, you make a note of it, which is important for character like abilities. So players need to be really on top of what your character does and how that works. Same thing for the DM. They need to be on top of what information they're presenting in the combat because that could be really beneficial when it comes to things like um, item placement or like location for um, players, like how far they are from each other or items, how how big the, the fight scape really is. Because for a superhero game, fights can be uh, massive. They can go from fights in small rooms to entire buildings, entire cities. They can be extremely uh, large in terms of um, like your space. So it's good to have an idea of what's in that space. So this game does kind of take the time to tell you on how to handle timing for your for your rounds and positions, line of sight and earshot, which is really important. All that really is important, and it's it does kind of add a lot on top of each other, but in my experience, you get used to it. You, you kind of get into a flow when you've been DMing, you have an idea of how to present information. And when you're in a, when you're a player, you should absolutely like be um, tr try to get information from the DM. You should ask like how far away am I from the enemies or from my teammates? Um, what kind of um, items are in the way? Are there obstacles? You know things like that. And that, that's very situational. That's very situational depending on the kind of game and uh, setting you're having. So you have things like uh, rules for taking your turns, delaying your turns. The standard actions in this game is just like attack, dodge, escape, grab, help, move, using your powers, and things like, things like reactions and even movement actions. That's cool. Um, falling damage is something. Um, different damage types that you can do. Damage reduction, like obviously you're going to have defenses. This is very much a heavy game on its mechanics just because it's a superhero game. You're going to have so many different types of people out there in this game that's going to be spewing different kinds of powers, let alone like it being magic or science or you're just a regular human. Um, they even have like a quick little table for combat weapons like pistols and hand uh, hand to hand weapons, which is really nice. They even go into some descriptions on how those work. Um, recovery for like healing and being unconscious and dying. Super important, in my opinion. Things like that is massively important. When you have a game like, um, let's say, D&D, &D, dying could be part of your game. That's something that you should talk to your um, players about if you want to have dying as an option. And that's totally true for this Marvel game. And that was true when I was doing uh, Mutants and Masterminds. When I was like, it's it's important for uh, you to feel like superheroes or supervillains in this dangerous world. So if you want to have death be something that could happen, you should definitely talk to your players before you just make them go down to zero health and they just flat out die and have to make a new character. Um, it's not like Alien or Call of Cthulhu where players have lower health and could naturally die a lot sooner and faster than um, other RPG games. So it's really important to have the distinction when it comes to these games. And then they have conditions like being blinded or paralyzed, bleeding. They have rules for uh, maneuvering levels, which I think is like um, floor levels, like uh, like the tenth story, like a skyscraper versus like a two story house. Um, and they have like object sizes, with really good for your Ant Man kind of people or your strength guys, from microscopic all the way to gargantuan, which is amazing. They have like stats and tables for that. Um, they have uh, rules for attacking inanimate objects or smashing through objects. You know, you got you got some big heavy hitters. Hulk and Juggernaut are some massive, massive enemies. They can do super damage to any area just by doing regular attacks. So, like, narratively, that would be really fun to kind of explore if that's your cup of tea. Or you could just kind of let it go and just be like, yeah, you know, the, the area looks kind of roughed up just for theater of the mind kind of stuff. But, you know, we're going to keep that mechanic kind of out of the way. So... When you're a DM or you're uh, players at a table, you should definitely come together and be like, here's the kind of rules that we're going to be focusing on. If it comes like a little too difficult to kind of keep track, we'll probably take some rules away. But that's obviously down to each individual table. Now we get to chapter five, which is creating your characters. Whether you're part of a team, your ranks, your backstories, other scores, 
these things are really important when making your character and we're just going to quickly gloss over this just because it's more involved on making your character i'm not really going to go into that but it's something that i think is really important because this is like superhero characters are so involved um something that i tried to do for mutants masterminds was make um a focus on like side characters you know like uh daredevil has his uh froggy nelson um superman has his uh lois lane lois lane is like a love interest but she's also like her own character she goes off on her own as a journalist um they have friends they have families that's really important for games like marvel and superhero games because you want them to feel like they're individuals in the world with the kind of relationship that superheroes have in D D, you're obviously like on an adventure, you're miles and continents away sometimes from your homeland, so you don't know a lot of people. So like that sense of being home or that sense of like protecting what is yours usually doesn't come up in such games. Um, but that's obviously, again, like different for each table. So when it comes to creating your character, you should definitely think about what kind of people are around your character specifically. Um, we get into things like whether your origins are from Atlantean or Deviant or Eternal, Skrull, uh, you could be like magic oriented, like demonic or werewolf. There's a lot of stuff. Even occupations goes into assassins, ed educators. It's very extensive. So there's a whole lot of stuff that you can add into your character. It's definitely a better sense to talk to your DM when it comes to play playing your character because he'll have the ideas all right here in the book that he could just give you. Which is really nice. Unless you have the book already, then you can just make it your own. But um, as a DM, I always buy the books specifically. Um, that's just me. You get now we can get into like the power sets, which I think is really crucial because um, powers are like really tricky because you kind of could put yourself into a corner depending on how you like set up your powers and and your in, in your game system. But it seems like it done pretty well here because they have um like power trees. Where like you'll you'll pick a certain power um, type and you'll get like these um, these list of abilities that you could do. Like we'll have elemental control, which adds an elemental barrage, which is like a blast attack. Um, elemental prison, elemental ricochet or sphere. Um, we get illusion spells like extend invisibility, grand illusion, uh, mirror images. There's also martial arts stuff like banging heads defense stances, fast strikes, uh, regaining your focus, spinning throws. Um, you get your omniversal kind of powers like dimensional portals, multiversal travel, uh, your plastic powers like your Mr. Fantastic, your body sphere, uh, flexible fingers, uh, melee weapons like uh, vicious attack or hit and run, shield attacks, spider powers, resize, super speed, telekinesis. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, to, to give like a better example, Something like telekinesis, where, like, it's levitation, that doesn't specifically mean, like, it's a mind power, right? Because that's, that's, that's how I think telekinesis is, is you're using your, your, specifically your mind to manipulate things. To get a better sense of that, you, like, you could still use levitation from the telekinesis tree and give it to something that's similar to maybe elemental control or, or magic. Magic could certainly be the same thing as telekinesis, right? Or, or god powers so like you, w once you get into bigger um kind of trees for these power sets you can definitely mix and match things start to bleed in together and that's where like obviously part of the the rule making and the stuff like that kind of gets blurred but honestly if you stick to the rules that the game presents to you i think you'll be okay um me personally the like the rules for these books are is just ink on paper they're never concrete you never have to fully follow them so like if you really need to change something like even if, if it's a small modifier for for an ability or maybe the ability is like not not as strong and if you talk to your dm you could modify it in some way even narratively you can make like a narrative reason why this power gets better so it's these are just guidelines in these books that's that, that's the way that i see it you know obviously some hard rules should be like followed uh depending on what it is but you know if, if it's all in the name of fun you know just make it fun that that's really just it if, if it comes down to the rules bogging down the gameplay making it slower just make it easier on yourself you know just have fun so there's a whole bunch of powers here which is amazing and they go into a lot of depth and there's a lot of um 
choices that you can have when it comes to making your characters. And it's fun to flip through. I, honestly, we get pages with like um, the new Ghost Rider, uh, this Captain America throwing his shield. The artwork is phenomenal. I'm going to try and get some pictures for you guys um, just because it's an amazing looking book. And this was only maybe like 40 or so dollars um, on off Amazon. And it's I'm so happy with this purchase. I really, really am. This book does also come with a extensive list of heroes and villains and other Marvel characters with stats and character sheets already written up for them that you can just take as your own if you really want to play a specific character from the universe or kind of make your own. Just take pieces from that character and put it on your own sheet. It's a really good template that you could use. You get uh, stats for like the AIM agents, Ant-Man, Average Citizens, Beast, Blade, Black Widow, uh, Captain Marvel, Devil Dinosaur, even Deadpool, Doctor Strange, Gore the God Butcher, Hellcat, Hella, Juggernaut, Jessica Jones, Kingpin, Modoc, Misty Knight, Mystique, Mysterio, Nick Fury, Nebula, Psylocke, Professor X, She-Hulk, Shang-Chi, both Miles Morales and Peter Parker, Spider-Man, Squirrel Girl, Spider-Man 2099, that's cool, Storm, Star-Lord, Thanos, Taskmaster, Titania, Thor, Vision, Venom, White Tiger, Wasp, Wong, Wolverine. I mean, you get some awesome character profiles just from this book alone, and that's not even talking about what's going to come out later on in the future, which I'll talk about later on towards the end of us talking about this book, but it seems like you get a lot of variety for characters to play as or take as inspiration for your own which is awesome and they all have their own stats their own character sheets already made so you just take them and play which is awesome to just getting right in there at the table and playing now the next chapter chapter nine is something that that i said previously uh in the beginning of this episode where this is something that's super important for creating your world and in my opinion, you if you're not super versed in the lore that you're making for a tabletop game, then the book should have some kind of supplement for understanding how the world works. You know, um, I, I don't claim myself to be the biggest savant of Marvel uh, lore, but I, I, I know my fair tidbit. You know, I, I can uh, I know my own stories for the arcs that are in the comics. I know where characters are at certain times in the comics. Uh, I wouldn't say so much like where they are now in the more recent runs for 2022, 2030. The last time I read a Marvel comic, um, I think was specifically um, one of the uh, newer X-Men runs where they just got to Krakoa. Um, and they have like the whole like Council of X and stuff like that. Really cool. Haven't been caught up on it a lot, but you don't need to be caught up on the Marvel comics to even enjoy this. You don't even need to know almost anything about the Marvel comics to enjoy this. You just need to know, you know, basic math and uh, superheroes. That's basically just it. So you get a good list of uh, how the Marvel Universe works. You get a, um, like, rules for ignoring information, making your own information, like I said before. You don't have to stick to canon ideas or events that's already happened in the comics you could take stuff that came from the video games you could take stuff that came from the mcu movies you like it's it's totally freeform you're not forced into any kind of corner when it comes to this um and i imagine even when it comes to um the uh campaign books and those settings that they're going to do later on in the future i imagine they're also going to be as freeform they're not going to lock down hard into specific canonized events Although maybe they will. Maybe they'll do like a Days of Future Past or a, a, a Dark Rain setting just, just to spice things up. They could do that. Um, you get a good overview of the Marvel Multiverse, especially the Earth-616 history all the way from World War II up until modern times um, with uh, Earth-616 today with the super teams. And you get a whole list of um, teams, areas like New York City, Avengers uh, Mansion, Baxter Buildings, Raft, uh, Earth Geography is, is great for Atlantis, Latveria, the Savage Land, Wakanda, um, even off-planet for like the Blue Area, Titan, Kunlun, Olympus, Otherworld. 
especially other universes. 2099, Days of Future Past, the Noir universe, the real world, the Spider-Gren universe is even referenced here. The Ultimate universe is even referenced here. Like, you can just make your own. What ifs are here. You don't have to specifically stick to 616 or MCU. Just make your own. That's what we did in um the Mutants and Masterminds game that we made. Uh, we had our own universe. It was based off of standard ideas for 616. Like, if you if a normal event happened in 616, it's basically just, it's already happened, just to kind of keep it, you know, relatively simple. And it just built up from there. We got even into some 2099 stuff by the end of it. We even got some what-if stuff towards the end. Really, really cool, interesting things you could do. Um, it even gives you tips for playing... The age, like the Golden Age, the Silver Age, Bronze, and Modern Age of Comics, if you're familiar with those. Those are very specific types of settings. Um, I'm not super versed in how they're all different, but for, you know, people who want to play in a more stylized setting, like from the 80s or the 70s, this is where you're going to go to kind of get that kind of sense. Um, there's even rules for moving between universes as like a player where like you're part of one campaign on one table, but you bring your character to another. If that's something you want to do, that's what it seems like. And then we get to the last chapter, which is all about being the narrator, the DM for the game. Something really important because you run the game. You make the you make the rules, you set the world, you put the characters where they're supposed to be, and you give them information, you give them obstacles, challenges, and you try to make the game overall fun. It gives you ideas and tips on how to pick opponents versus your uh, player characters, uh, even things for taking breaks, like stopping the clock for like maybe 20 minutes during a session, or maybe you skip a week in your in your game just to keep things, uh, you know, simple for time issues, wrapping up your games, you know, getting them all um, done and over with. Um, even the scope of your games. What if you want to have like a, like a one-shot, one-session game for a single issue or an entire graphic novel or ongoing series? They kind of equate it in comic book terms, which I really like. Um, they help with things like mind control or those kind of settings that are really difficult for... Or the, the type of scenarios that are really difficult to do narratively uh, against like other people, like player characters. You know, so like if you do mind control, you should definitely have a discussion on like how mind control would work, or if that's part of your character's backstory, or if it's going to be a supervillain power later on. It's definitely something that's, that's going to be uh, thought about as a DM. Uh, it gives you tips on social interactions, like in-game and out-of-game. Those are two very important things, because when it comes to playing these games, you should differentiate what information is presented as in-game, being said or done kind of actions, and if a player character or a PC is just talking to the table in general, making a, a snide comment to be funny or something like that. Um, that kind of distinction is super important. So if your table isn't really good at that, you should probably get a, a good grasp on that because it could cause confusion, especially when it comes to super narrative um, play or um, trying to get combat down in a concise manner. You get things like dealing with all kinds of powers, how to deal with group dynamics, working with the ranks, like I said, Adjusting adventures on the fly. Maybe your game is a little too gritty at the start and you want maybe it just like tone it down a little bit. Um, there's a whole slew of stuff that you can use here to help you make your game. And this is great for people who have, haven't have DM'd, who have never done it before but would like to. Absolutely, if you're going to, this is like the chapter you're going to want to read first after probably the rules or probably vice versa. You can probably mix and match uh, how that goes, but... It's definitely something that you're going to need to have an idea on. And we're getting towards the end of the book. It does give you some stuff for uh, having game styles, like if it's more action or comedy or mystery-centered, uh, like gritty, like I said. Um, designing your adventures, like do you want your game to be... Uh, or it says like designing your adventures for how much time you're going to put into it, like setting up your plot, your hooks, uh, your plot points... And then set up some payoffs, things like that. Now, like, no no one here who wants to be a DM needs to be, like, a master writer. You don't need to make every, every storyline be super important and intricate. It just should be fun. It should be, like, simple information 
to give to the players and let the players use that information and interact with the story that you're going to present to them. That's how it really should work. So it's obviously a learning curve when it comes to creating your own kind of world. Um, games like this are always more open to being like changed on the fly, and that's really important. Um, as a narrator, you even get to make the game around events that you want. It even gives a list of events that you could use, like Age of Ultron, the Civil War, the Kree Skull, and Secret Empire, uh, World War Hulk events. You can use those for your own game. Uh, even in my game, I kind of took a good spin on Secret Invasion and World War Hulk when I was doing uh, my Mutants Masterminds game. Um which was really nice because you can change it on your own and make it your own kind of um, event. It even gives you good help on getting your player characters like NPC friends. Like like I said, uh, Matt Murdock has like his Froggy Nelson and Superman has his Lois Lane. So it gives you help on making NPC friends and families, work friends, romances, rivals for your player characters, which is really nice. That was something that I fo tried to focus on in Mutants and Masterminds. I think I did a pretty good job. And the book even gives you help on creating and playing villains, which are big important for uh, superhero games and doing things like monologuing and dealing with like rank X characters that are super, super strong, which is going to be like your Galactus kind of beings, I suppose. Um, and then that's that's basically it for the book. You get some... Nice appendix stuff with um, character trees. You get a blank character sheet that you can uh, print out on your own. And then the glossary index for all your terms and rules and stuff. And then and then the book ends. And it's roughly, um, I think, 300 more pages. Yeah, like 315 or so pages large. And this was a good purchase. An absolutely good purchase. And... I hope you guys, you know, if you want to play this game, go out and buy it. I hope you really do. If you like RPG games or Marvel at all. Um, not to say that this is over, but there is some more things to talk about for the Marvel Multiverse role-playing game. And that's, um, they're going to have expansions for this game. I believe already, if you buy it on the Demiplane system or um, um, website, you can get the Super Scroll Adventure, which is like a small... Um, one-off adventure that you can quickly play involving the scrolls but in the future i think next month or maybe later this month is the release of the kang adventure um uh, kang is, will be the big super villain for the scenario and it'll be like a larger kind of campaign book for your for your game setting and that seems really really dope especially coming off of um uh, the Kang Dynasty MCU movies may be coming out in the future. That that all stuff is really up in the air if you've been keeping up with anything involved in that. Um, and then I think next year is the X-Men and the Spider-Verse supplement books, which should have a lot of ideas and helpful tips on making an X-Men type setting, an X-Men team. It should absolutely give an extensive amount of X-Men lore for you to use. And more character profiles, villains, and heroes to play as, as well as probably locations and things like that. And especially like a like a small campaign story it'll probably have. Uh, I hope it even has like X-Force and um, uh, like the, the New Mutants, uh, which is really cool. I, I love everything about the X-Men. And then they got the Spider-Verse, which is going to be everything Spider-Verse, you know. Basically all the Spider-Men, probably uh, Null and uh the web queen or whatever her her name is uh madam web right and it's gonna have a whole bunch of stuff on that so that's that's really dope in in my opinion because it's only gonna get better you know we're probably gonna get like a a magic book maybe or a guardians of the galaxy book would be would be really tight um yeah that's that's basically it for the marvel multiverse rpg um if you guys like anything about this uh, RPG book, let me know in the comments. Uh, leave a comment on what kind of game you want to run for it or if you want to play a certain hero ever. And uh, I'll leave off with this. I have so much free time uh, sometimes where I could, I want to start playing and DMing more. So keep on the lookout on the website startplaying.com where you could become a player in my 
future RPG games. I've been thinking about starting an RPG game just with um, random people online who would like to play. And I haven't decided on the game yet. It's honestly either going to be the Marvel Multiverses game or the Walking Dead game that has recently come out. Um, I got the PDF for it. I'm waiting on the books, so fingers crossed. And that's that's really just it. This is a really good purchase. I love flipping through this book. The art looks amazing. I don't understand the rules so much, but that's something I'm willing to learn, absolutely. And that's that's basically just it on, on this. So a few weeks back, you guys can find the episode in the playlist, but I read The Ring by Koji Suzuki, which is the book that inspired the movie The Ring that was a phenomenon back in the early 2000s about the killer videotape that kills you in seven days. And the book was phenomenal. I loved it. It actually was like a mystery thriller kind of thing rather than a weird um, supernatural um, thriller. Um, it still had hints of that, but I, I actually liked the book a lot more than than the movie. And that was honestly what really propelled me into reading the sequels. Now, if you thought the, the Ring series ended after the first movie, or actually there's even sequels, but I, I don't even know if those are really good in the movie sense, like the Americanized version. Um, I think they even have adaptations for the sequel novels. But Koji Suzuki wrote two uh, legitimate sequels to the series. He has some other ones that I haven't been able to find. Um, the two main sequels to his story is Spiral and Loop. Spiral is the second in the series, and Loop is the third. And Spiral takes place right after the events of the first book with a character named Ando Michuo, who is a coroner who is recently just grieving uh, his son's death from a while back. And he is assigned uh, an autopsy of an old classmate, Ryuji Takayama, who is a character in the first book. So that, that's where the bridge comes from. It's, it's uh, Ando investigating the death of his friend, and it goes into some wild territory. Absolutely. And I actually kind of liked it. Honestly, it, it stopped being like a videotape ghost story and more of a kind of sci-fi um, story in, in some regard. It has a lot more hints on sci-fi than I think Supernatural. Uh, th those kind of things can be blurred, uh, obviously. But I thought it was really entertaining. Um, there's some really good characters here. And it also felt like a, a good mystery just for figuring out what is happening. And it uh, obviously it doesn't end there because there is a sequel in the series. Uh, Loop is the third, uh, technically the finale of the series um, as far as I know. But it was really enjoyable, both books. Loop has to do with a medical student whose father has contracted a uh, new type of cancer where... All the people that his father worked with um, on the Loop project, uh, they have all contracted the same kind of cancer. And then that, now they're dying one by one. So not, really not to give any spoilers because I absolutely don't want to give up any type of information for these two books. I totally recommend reading Ring first or maybe even watching the movie The Ring before you get into these books. Um, just because uh, Ring is probably the easiest to digest. Absolutely. It makes the most sense, like just from a supernatural kind of storyline way. It, it, it is the most easy to comprehend. The, the sequel books get into far more sci-fi territory than, than, than you would think. And it uh, it is concerning, like just because like you, you can imagine this maybe being a real thing. Uh, it's supernatural that way. But like if this was like a real thing that happened, that would that would blow. Um, I... I had, like, some hopes for this book. There were things I was hoping would happen in the, in the series that they kind of don't really delve on or, like, um, give more, like, uh, information on or flesh out, which I, I don't think is all that bad, but it was something that, that kept me wanting to read the series. And I, honestly, by the end, the payoff is really good. I think the ending for it is absolutely really enjoyable. And the series doesn't stop there. Koji Suzuki did not stop on this series. Um, he has a short story collection for the series called Birthday. Um, then he gets into two more uh, sequel novels. One is called S and one is called Tide. I'm currently trying to find S now in um, English 
uh, paperback form, but that's proving to be a little hard. But I, I'm totally going to read the rest of the series because I, I find it really enjoyable. I find it uh, intriguing to see where this story leads. And I, I never thought that Spiral and Loop would have turned out the way it was. I, I personally thought it was just going to become more of like um, more videotape kind of stuff. And then um, I'll, I'll give a brief spoiler. It kind of teases the fact that Sadako, the, the girl in the uh, tape, moves on to another like media, which is like movies or another um, like handheld or like not handheld but like a book, like a physical, physical copy book that you could read. And that's supernatural all on its own, but it's intriguing to see that happen, and you don't get a lot of information on that. It's kind of hint that, that it is the way it is, uh, but you don't get all the information in just all these books. So it's a good incentive to read Birthday and S and Tide, um, in my opinion. So shout out to Koji Suzuki, who, as somebody who's not very versed in the overseas horror um, or sci-fi genres for, for books or anything. Um, I found these great, you know, like I think the Ring series for the movies probably gets a lot of shit for being, uh, you know, not that great. It's an early 2000s movie, so like I, I think like before 2008, you kind of can't really harp on those movies all that much. There's some good gems from that era, and I think the Ring is one of those ones. It's original, it's um, entertaining. And the movie is just as good as the book, even though I like the book better. Um, and the sequels just do it far more justice because it's a different narrative. It's something really um, exciting to read. Uh, that's that's really just it. You know, it, it wasn't super scary, but it was definitely, like, gripping. Like, I was had to get forward more and more towards the end of each, each of these books. And that's all I really got to say on those, to be honest. Um, these were a really good read. Absolutely. I would totally read them again later on maybe for like a, a halloween session or something down the road in a few years but that's that's really just it for for these books that i've been reading now if we want to get into some other cool stuff before we wrap up i actually completely forgot to talk about this uh when i first recorded the first set of the episode um but i'll add it in here just real quick towards the end and i saw oppenheimer earlier this week and that was a phenomenal movie Truly, truly phenomenal. Um, I think it really was a good portrayal of his his life and what he went through as uh, a person uh, dealing with being a scholar and then working with the government. You don't get a lot of his early life, which I think is pretty good. Um, you don't really see all that. That's not really... Um, I, I guess it wasn't that important to the story. But you get a good idea of the state of like World War or like like post World War One, uh, early World War Two, and the mindset of the the people there, um, the government, um, even like overseas, and uh, Oppenheimer seems like a um, like an unsung hero for like humanity. That's probably not like the word to use or the phrase, but I mean. You know, it's it's a period piece on like one of the most pinnacle moments in our history. You know, the the, the creation of a uh, mass uh, extinction device like these atom bombs that we were making. You know, and the entirety of the world possibly going up in flames during the use of one of them is is scary. And you can certainly find parallels between um, Oppenheimer. Um, the movie and like our times now um, is obviously it delves into Cold War stuff and what happened to Oppenheimer um, after World War Two and all that kind of stuff. It was a really great period piece. Um, I wasn't so much of a fan of his like love life uh, stuff included. I mean, that, that's probably what really happened to him in, in the real world, but it just kind of felt like it wasn't really needed in, in the in the story it didn't seem like Oppenheimer really even liked any of his uh girlfriends or, or wives or, or whatever he had in in the in the story but overall I enjoyed it my favorite thing my favorite thing was seeing Joss Peck and how he had um one line he had we had one line and I think it was um like 40 or 30 seconds like it was right before the big countdown was going to happen he that was the only line he said and that was great that was really good uh uh like uh fun little 
Easter egg thing to have for Josh Peck. It was good seeing him again uh, in this movie. But if you haven't seen Oppenheimer, you absolutely should. It was really, really, uh, really, really enjoyable. Um, we could talk about what book I am going to be talking about next on this podcast, and that is the Dead Space Martyr book by B.K. Evanson. Um, this is a prequel novel, technically set before the events of Dead Space, um, and I am still also going through the Dead Space game on Impossible. Um, no clue if I'm going to be completely finishing that game before I finish this book, and I'm going to try and actually get and read the sequel book, Dead Space Catalyst, to try and do like a much larger kind of Dead Space-centered episode, but we'll see. Um, but I'm reading Dead Space Martyr, and you get some pretty good information um, on this. You get some some good ideas of what the marker is and uh, how humanity started to treat the marker. Um, for anybody who's played like Dead Space two and three, you obviously know that like the the lore gets a little more extensive by that time. So I found it to be really fun as as a read for myself. And I'm also still playing through Pikmin. I did just rescue um, um, Olimar, and I cured him. And now I'm just going through the later stuff after that. Um, I think I'm going to try and get all the treasures and all the scientist people. That's probably as much as I'll go. But Pikmin's really fun. Um, Warhammer Space Marine still needs to be completed by me. So uh, it's becoming a little hard to get, find time to make games and, and do all this with um, the full-time job that I have and reading books and stuff. But... I'm I'm really just here to talk about the things that I enjoy for you guys, you know. I don't know if I'm funny or entertaining at all, but I'm just a guy speaking into a mic. And I truly hope you guys give a shot to one of these books or games that I've been talking about for the last few weeks because I think there's something here for everybody. You know, I try to keep it pretty wide with the variety. I try to keep it um, around the same realm of each other, like if we're going to be doing... Uh, a book series. I'm gonna try and keep the book series around the same, like episode length, kind of like we did with Spiral and Loop. Um, that all is very difficult to to manage, at least for now. Um, I'm just really just talking my ass off, to be honest. But I hope you guys have a good weekend. This episode will probably be up today, recording on the Friday. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you guys next time. <laughs>